This is a pyelonidal sinus. I probed it and I find that it's going upwards about two centimeters sideways and you see the MRI also has given us the same picture. We are going to see that we excise it completely and then how we prevent recurrences, how I go about excising it. I'll, I'll share some pyelonidal surgery tips with you. You see, I have marked the area which I definitely need to remove. And now I'll mark the incisions. This is the area which must go out. The incisions have to be marked in a way that my closure shifts the midline to the side. So if I remove it like this, then the midline is going to be here only. So I'm going to remove it in this way. So now when I fill it, I'll show you how we fill it. You see, I'm injecting some methylene blue into it so that the tracts get delineated. When I'm excising this area, nowhere should I see in my wide local excision a uh, touch of the ink, you know. You see, if I'm bloodless, I'm not likely to miss the tracts. So I try and stay as bloodless as possible so that I'm not blinded by blood, you know. This might be the abscess cavity, you know. Nowhere so far have we come close to the ink, you know. We are staying as bloodless as possible. There's never, not so far been a drop of blood. You know, it needs to be removed just like we remove cancer. That nowhere should we be coming close to the cavity or the lesion. You see, we are all the time in absolutely clean fields. Nowhere have we opened the cavity of the pyelonidal sinus. Uh, every millimeter needs to be under traction and come to traction for any surgery you see you can see the ink here but we haven't uh, allowed it to spill so i'm going to go deeper than that i'm almost at the bone so you see this kind of a clean field is required for a complete excision so you see the first two or three prerequisites was not to operate in an acute stage. Secondly, to make an excision in a way that the midline is shifted. See, now the midline is going to be like this. And the third is now that excision has to be absolutely complete. Uh, nowhere should the ink spill. Entire region needs to be removed, just like we do a cancer surgery as if, you know. Being an oncosurgeon, I have special interest in pyloridal sinus because it requires an oncological radical excision. So now the last but not the least is if we close it, then also because it's a, like closing the roof of a well, there's a well inside. So it'll take a long time to heal. It'll open up. It may not recur because we are going to complete, we have already removed it, but it will still open up. So it's like almost leaving it open then. So we are going to rotate the flap in a way. I'll show you how that the whole thing gets filled by, by the tissues from the sides. You see, the first and foremost, I'm going to raise the subfacial flaps all around. Then I'll decide which flap to raise. 
So this is, this is how we have planned the mm. flap. This is a rhomboid which we have imagined. Uh, this is the short um, axis. We have extended the short axis this side. And uh, mm, uh, the size is, I mean, this is equal to this and this is equal to this. And the whole thing, whole thing we are going to mobilize so that this goes here and this goes here and the cavity gets filled. You see, we have raised this subfacial flap. It's a pretty vascular flap. So what is going to happen is that this D is going to come to B okay, like this. It will fill up and the E is going to come to C. Okay. And this D dash is going to go to E. So this is how the flap is going to fill it up and it's going to become a Z. I'll show it to you once we close it. Now, the last thing is, which is most important is that we have to close it in multiple layers, not in a single layer. We have to see that the whole cavity gets filled up with, um, you know, Vicryl 3020 stitches inside. We'll close the cavity. So I'm taking deep sutures here you know just like it should be falling this is falling here this is falling here so i'm taking deep sutures i've placed a drain underneath a drain is a must and we'll not remove the drain till even 10 ml is coming so it's filled up you know we consider the dermal inverted dermal sutures are very important to hold skin you know because the skin sutures which we apply they stay only for say 14 days thereafter you have to remove them but these dermal sutures they will support the skin for more than four to six weeks you know and they will provide strength to the skin so we are putting inverted dermal sutures as the last layer before the skin closure the skin closure now we are likely to do it with a uh, you know with a subcuticular monocryl suturing this is how it's filled up you know the whole thing from the side has filled up this cavity and the um, this has become like a you know this kind of a shape Fine. So I'm going to put subcuticular sutures here. That's how it's finally come. We put subcuticular sutures supporting a few ethylon sutures in between. And um, the ethylons, we'll remove it around the 7th, 8th day. And um, I think he should do very well. There's no reason why he should recur. We've done all that was that's supposed to be done with surgical precision.